and we are recording. All right, we will get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Bruce Smith calling from uh, from CRH, and we're going to pass it over to Eric Lenning here momentarily. I just wanted to kick us off with a few uh, quick comments about uh, what we're about to see here. Uh, back up just a little bit. Of course, uh, most offices in Central Region uh, began our demonstration of Forecast Builder back on October 1. And for precipitation type, uh, top-down technique uh, developed and pushed forward uh, by Dan Baumgart, uh, Andy Just, and a few others is what Forecast Builder, of course, is currently using. Uh, concurrent with uh, our demonstration in the background, Eric uh, and Kevin Burke at Chicago have been uh, testing uh, another uh, approach to P-Type, as you can see on your screen, the Burgoyne Energy uh, approach to P-Type. And uh, just operating in the background, and I basically wanted to say as we kick this off that, uh, you know, we don't have an active competition per se going on here at all. It's not one or the other. It's just the scientific process uh, playing itself out here. And, uh, you know, Eric uh, pushed this forward and wanted to kind of show the results from this past winter, and that's that's why we're all here this morning. So uh, we we certainly had no shortage of mixed precipitation events this particular winter. I, I know in the upper Midwest it's been... Uh, it's been one after another, it seems like. So uh, a great winner to uh, to test uh, the various approaches. So uh, I want to thank Eric uh, for, for stepping up and doing this along with Kevin. And uh, I see from our participant list, we've got uh, some cross-regional participants uh, on board as well here this morning. So that's great. Uh, so with that background, I will just pass this on over to uh, Kevin and Eric. All right. Uh, thanks, Bruce. And uh, thanks for everyone else uh, for getting on the call. Uh, we wanted to kind of reiterate what Bruce said. You know, this is not any kind of competition um, with the existing forecast builders. Just really a great opportunity that uh, we have the forecast builder that we can now do some local science that would eventually be um, transferable to other offices through this forecast builder framework. And so uh, that's what we've been working on here. Uh, myself and Kevin Burke. Kevin has really been doing a lot of this work for the office and he will give uh, most of this talk today but I wanted to just kind of introduce uh, what we're going to be discussing. Um, this was kind of a local test bed here at, at this office during this winter. Uh, we haven't had a lot of snow but we have like Bruce said we've had a lot of mixed precip events so it has been kind of an interesting winter to look at this tool. Um, this has been done in coordination with the forecast builder team and it's not an independent effort. Uh, we've been keeping them apprised of our work. And uh, originally, this webinar today was just really going to be a briefing for the Forecast Builder team. But um, we, you know, are very glad that um, we're able to share this with the uh, the entire region and, and beyond. So we're just going to be offering a um, explanation of the revised technique. I think that's important if we are speaking to a wider audience because. Um, you don't necessarily understand the technique. It's it's hard to understand exactly um, what what it is we're doing, and uh, we're going to look at two recent mixed precip events that we had in the area in a little bit of detail and uh, talk very briefly about the future steps in this process. And uh, I'll turn this part over to Kevin. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as we're all familiar with the top-down approach here, we all need to know. First of all, do we have ice present in our clouds? And then what kind of warm or cold layers is our hydrometeor going to encounter as it uh, falls towards the surface? So the, the Max-T aloft version, of course, assumes that the magnitude of the depth, or the, I'm sorry, the magnitude of the warm layer is proportional to its depth, uh, which works in a lot of cases. Uh, however, we found some, you know, cases where we get cool but deep warm layers, deep isothermal layers, and in those cases, sometimes the depth of that layer is important. So basically, we can define our hydrometeor type at the surface being dependent upon, again, is ice present in the clouds? We still need to know that. But also now this area of our warm and our cold layers. And by getting th certain thresholds, we can then help determine what type of precip type we could expect at the surface, similar to what we do with the max TW aloft method. 
Uh, just looking at the max teal off relative to the warm layer depth, when you look at a large range of temperatures here, especially plus four Celsius and higher, there's really, really good fit here uh, between the um, maximum temperature in that layer and the depth of the warm layer. But for cooler temperatures, because sometimes we get those deep isothermal layers, there tends to be you know, more of a spread here and a less even fit uh, for these cooler temperatures, especially from zero to plus three aloft. And that's a little bit of the motivation here behind uh, trying out this uh, area method, such as the Burgoyne. Uh, just to kind of illustrate this here a little bit further, some of the uh, things we've noticed, uh, consider these two environments here. These are two um, AMDAR soundings out of the Chicago area for two different events. Both of them have a max temperature aloft of about plus one, and the surface temp was about 33 in both cases. So then, you know, I pose the question, would you expect the same type of precipitation at the surface out of both of these environments? Obviously, the sounding here on the left has a deep isothermal layer that's much deeper than the one on the uh, right. Likewise, in the low levels, you have a shallower uh, sub-freezing layer here near the surface relative to our sounding here on the right. So if we use a Burgoyne technique, and we'll talk a little bit about um, more how this is calculated here in a bit, but uh, it, again, it's kind of an area method that's measured in terms of uh, energies, joules per kilogram, just like CAPE. If we do that, we see that we get, you know, a number here close to 30 joules per kilogram, which tells us that we have enough warmth here to result in total melting of the hydrometeor. And then as we get into the lower levels here, um, we don't have enough negative energy for refreeze potential. So basically, the modified Burgoyne technique here would tell us that this would be a, a pure rain sounding. Uh, the Max T aloft, um, I know they, that uh, Dan and um, Andy have added some code lately to help with this situation. So um, I, I believe this situation would give a mix. I could be wrong on that, though. I think they did some uh, stuff for uh, Max T's um, of plus one and below. But uh, again, so uh, if I'm wrong about that, you can correct me. Um, but again, the actual uh, precip during this was uh, indeed rain. And then in this uh, particular sounding here, um, again, a lot more cold air at the surface, and this is uh, the negative energy uh, that's showing up here. And again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what these are uh, coming up if you're not familiar with these. But uh, basically, this tells us we don't have enough for total melting. There'll probably be some type of melting but some of the uh, bigger hydrometeors would likely uh, be able to survive this layer and uh, make it to the surface. So overall, this would support a mix of rain, snow, and uh, sleet, so pretty much everything there. And that's sure enough what the, uh, what the reports were coming in at, snow and rain with periods of sleet. And the Max T aloft, I think, in this version would either give a mix as well or, or just rain. All right, so um, did you want to take over here? Okay, I'm going to hand things back over to Eric here momentarily. All right, so this uh, idea of the positive energy and the negative energy is, like Kevin mentioned, uh, similar to the concept of CAPE, where you compute the joules per kilogram uh, in the warm layer and then in the uh, cold or sub-freezing layer. So uh, that accounts just for the, the magnitude and the depth of the layer, or that's the, the true melting freezing energy. It's not a proxy. It's just the actual energy in that layer, um, which could, you know, maybe uh, we think provide a better precip type forecast um, given decent model forecasts. And you can, ca you can calculate this using either the temperature or the wet bulb profile. Um, I think forecast builder tools have all migrated to wet bulbs, so uh, that's what we typically use. Uh, in a little bit more detail, just to understand the concepts here, um, uh, Pierre Bourguin, uh I think, put together some uh, research in the uh, October 2000 um, weather forecasting, and he came up with these uh, relationships between the positive area and the negative area, 
And it's, it's what we're basically familiar with. Uh, so I'll walk you through this basically. When you have a little bit of positive energy aloft and a lot of negative energy, uh, you're looking at sleep potential. And so that's uh, ex illustrated here. And uh, as you get more positive energy aloft and less negative energy for refreezing, you're looking at freezing rain potential. And that's illustrated uh, in the upper left sounding. And that's a sounding that crosses the freezing line uh, two times. So you get the positive energy aloft, and the negative energy, and then you are below freezing at the surface. Uh, the other scenario would be if you're dealing with uh, just a single warm layer at the surface, the question is do you have enough energy to melt the snow into rain? And according to his technique, if you only have about 13 joules or below, you're still going to maintain some snow in that layer. And um, as you start to get about five or six joules, you will begin to introduce some rain as well. And you can see that there's an area where you overlap and you have both snow and rain, where you have partial melting of snow but not complete melting. Uh, to look at this uh, in a kind of different way, I think illustrates the advantages of this technique over other variables that you commonly hear people talk about. And that might be the height of the freezing level or the wet bulb zero maybe the max temperature in the layer, or maybe just looking at the surface temperature. But none of those really tell you the true profile of that, uh, that warm layer. So this is a rain versus snow situation. And your profile might look like this. And you can calculate the energy or the, the area of that triangle and uh, come up with 0.36. But a very different triangle also has an energy of, or, or an area of 0.36. Uh, even though they have very different surface temperatures, very different max layer temperatures, very different uh, freezing heights or wet below zero heights. So they have the same amount of melting potential given very different um, parameters. And uh, here's a smaller triangle that has the same max temperature aloft but clearly far less energy. And uh, this technique is easily adjustable for elevation. You just uh, subtract a portion of that polygon there. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Kevin. OK, uh, I thought we'd just go over some of the modifications we made to the original Burgoyne method here. Um, first of all, we use the uh, wet bulb profile rather than the temperature to account for dry layers and cooling. So that kind of matches up with uh, the current technique of using the max uh, wet bulb temperature aloft. Uh, now that most uh, central region forecast offices are using. Uh, we also tune the uh, sleet liquid threshold lines uh, in coordination with Dan and uh, Andy up in La Crosse. Uh, so we'll look, look at uh, those new thresholds that we defined. And then finally we assigned um, probabilities of precipitation types for basically a wider range around the uh, thresholds. And this was to account for model uncertainty and even uncertainties in the actual hydrometeor size. Um, so uh, we implemented this into the forecast process into GFE by using uh, three new grids here. And hopefully in the future we could try to whittle this down to two grids. But uh, first of all, the probability of ice present grid that is used in the max TW aloft version is still used here because we still need to have knowledge of that. Um, but these other grids you notice here, there's this positive energy total grid that we use. And this accounts for if there's multiple warm layers in the sounding uh, overall. So it's adding them all up together to get the total melting energy. And uh, here's an example of one of the grids here uh, showing the positive energy total. And we've actually uh, developed some nice color curves here. So we can use this as easily defining where the rain snow line would be uh, in the model output. So basically values above 20 joules per kilogram uh, are shown here in green. And that's basically considered enough to be enough melting for liquid to be favored in those regions. Uh, and then a mix between about 5 and 20 uh, joules per kilogram, similar to the original Burgoyne method, if you're uh, familiar with that, just a wider range. So again, snow likely in this region if it's precipitating, and then likely uh, rain in that area. Uh, finally, when we get into more complicated scenarios where we need to look at sleet and freezing rain potential, uh, we have this uh, negative energy low-level grid 
which is basically measuring the amount of cold air in the low levels below about 850 millibars. Um, so this grid here in the image is showing the negative energy and uh, you see the color codes here. The blue areas represent values uh, in excess of 100 joules per kilogram uh, for negative energy and that's considered to be uh, a good amount of cold cold air for, for refreeze potential. And uh, finally overlaid here in contours is what we call the positive energy aloft. It's basically the melting energy above 900 millibars. And I tell the forecasters here I always recommend uh, that they overlay this with the negative energy because basically you're able to see where your warm layer aloft overruns a really cold layer near the surface. So like in this example here, we see these uh, contours overrunning into these uh, colder areas. That would be where we would uh, be favored for sleep potential in the Burgoyne method. So it's, it's kind of a, a concept, too, that helps point to certain areas to, if anything, uh, take a closer look at uh, soundings and so forth in that region. Uh, here's the uh, new sleet liquid probabilities that we defined. Uh, these are much shallower sloped than the original Burgoyne method. Uh, and again, notice for the sleet probabilities up here, you really need to get uh, low-level negative energy in excess of 100 joules per kilogram uh, to get the best sleep potential. And then on the x-axis here, the positive energy aloft. So you can see as you get more and more positive energy aloft, you do need more negative energy. But uh, as we'll see on the next slide, it's much shallower uh, slope than the original Burgoyne technique. Uh, for the liquid probabilities are basically just the inverse for the most part of the, uh, the sleep probabilities. And uh, here's, here's uh, some of the research we've been doing, and again, in coordination with Dan and Andy up in La Crosse, they've been a big help. Um, we uh, defined a line much shallower here uh, because we were finding sleet events with warmer positive energy aloft, so warmer uh, warm layers uh, with the uh, cold negative energy. So again, we, th we think that this uh, original Burgoyne might be too steep. So better uh, verification, we think, is going to happen with this uh, shallower sloped line. All right, so, you know, if you're on the forecast and you're just, you know, doing a rain, simple rain-snow scenario here, uh, this is kind of the thresholds we're looking at here. Again, we're looking at the positive energy total grid, and this, again, is telling us where our rain-snow line is. So basically right across the Chicago metro. Uh, in this particular case. Uh, as far as the thresholds, again, following the original Burgoyne technique, we didn't deviate too much uh, from this. About 10 to 13 and a half joules per kilogram are going to give you an even rain snow uh, probabilities. But as you get warmer than 13 and a half joules per kilogram, you start to favor liquid more and more until you get to 20 and you're basically favored for all liquid. And that's the green areas that you see here. Uh, likewise, you get below 10 joules per kilogram, you, you get more and more favored for snow until you get down in this area, and it, you, it's basically an all-snow profile. For the more complicated scenarios when you're, you're worried about sleet and freezing rain, again, the positive energy total will be able to tell you where areas would be favored for snow. But for sleet and freezing rain, then you're going to have to revert to this negative energy grid with the positive energy aloft overlaid. And this is actually an event uh, that occurred across southern Wisconsin last March. And it was a really good sleet event for them. They got uh, a lot of sleet and uh, freezing rain in this region. So you can see here the uh, Burgoyne method was forecasting a pretty good corridor of... Uh, of sleet here across uh, southern Wisconsin. And basically this is what we're looking at here in plan view. So our positive energy aloft, that's the contours, and then the negative energy in the low levels is, is the uh, actual uh, grid value, which because it's blue it's in excess of 100 joules per kilogram. 
All right, so then uh, that's a little bit about the method and so forth. Let's just go through a couple of events we've had here. Uh, both of these were very close to each other back in January. Uh, the first one was a sleet freezing rain event over northern Illinois. And then uh, the second one was uh, a freezing rain event with a brief period of sleet across the upper Midwest on January 15th and 16th. So uh, first of all, the uh, Thursday morning uh, one here in northern Illinois. Uh, this was a this was a tricky one. Uh, we had a, a cold front and a weak uh, surface feature come across the area during the day on the 11th, and it produced a period of uh, freezing rain across far northern Illinois uh, into the early evening, and then there was kind of a lull in the precip, some periods of freezing drizzle. We had a freezing rain advisory in effect uh, for the area. And we were expecting the potential for another wave of activity to approach the area uh, early Thursday morning. But uh, there, there were questions initially on how much precip would occur, if any, with this, uh, this first wave. And just to kind of show that here, I've got the uh, NAM 3 kilometer. Uh, first of all, 24-hour forecast ballot uh, 12Z on January 12th. And you can see it was not uh, painting much precip into northern Illinois at all. But as we got closer to the event, the model started to pick up on a better wave and a better precip signal for uh, a mixed precip signal as well over the region. Uh, just to further illustrate this and kind of the sensitivity to the probability of ice presence still even in the uh, Burgoyne method here, um, the first two soundings here are from Gary, Indiana, and if you're not familiar, that's uh, in far northwest Indiana on the southern shores of Lake Michigan. Um, so this is the GFS forecast, uh, basically from 12Z the day before. So we're looking at 21 hours out and 24 hours out here into the morning of the 12th. Notice a nice, distinct dry layer in this region. So initially, we were thinking we might just be dealing with drizzle or freezing drizzle. However, as we got closer to the event, you can see the soundings here by 12Z, uh, just six hours out from the 60 GFS, were much, much uh, moist, more moist and uh, were showing much more, uh, much more forcing uh, for this particular event. So now you can see the profile here is certainly resembling something that would look like sleet. And sure enough, the uh, overnight shift that night caught on to this, and uh, they were able to use higher uh, probability of ice present grids as the uh, negative energy grid here, shown with the positive energy aloft overlaid. I've circled the area here. There was a nice corridor uh, from Chicago west-southwestward that was uh, favored for sleet potential. And this is the uh, probability of sleet that came out of this particular case. Uh, this turned out to be a pretty heavy a period of heavy sleet across the area. It only lasted about two to four hours, uh, but there were accumulations of sleet over the area, uh, at least a few tenths of an inch, and uh, roads were pretty pretty messy that morning. I remember driving into work; it was pretty slick across the region. So overall, this particular event again shows the, still the sensitivity to the knowledge of whether or not ice would be present in the clouds. And uh, this is just an AMDAR sounding uh, from that morning. This is from 1246 Zulu on the uh, 12th from Midway Airport. Uh, Eric here actually wrote this program. It's really nice. It uh, grabs the uh, AMDAR soundings in real time and calculates the energies for use for the forecasters to kind of spits out what uh, precip type might be possible. So in this case, we had 33 joules of uh, warm layer aloft over the top of a pretty cold layer here, 190 joules per kilogram in the low levels. So definitely, uh, you can see here it favored uh, sleet and uh, freezing rain. And sure enough, that's, that's what was occurring at the time of this uh, sounding. All right, and then if we uh, fast forward just a couple of days to uh, kind of Sunday night, January 15th and 16th, uh, this was following a pretty good ice event that occurred across uh, Missouri and downstate Illinois. 
uh, if you remember, and then the last part of this wave of precip lifted northward into northern Illinois and the upper Midwest. And this was a, a, a pretty good test for the uh, Burgoyne method here because uh, we were able to see what the uh, neighboring offices using the Max TW aloft were getting. And uh, overall, they were getting several hours of sleet and freezing rain with this event, but the uh, modified Burgoyne technique was giving us mainly freezing rain and uh, a very short one to two hour period where sleet was uh, mixing in with the freezing rain. And um, it's, it's really interesting here. This is showing the, uh, these, these figures are from the wrap. These are the negative energy grids from the wrap shown. And it's, it's hard to see. Unfortunately, this isn't the best color. But uh, in yellow, if you can see those, those are the, that's the uh, positive energy aloft that's overlaid here. Uh, so we're looking at 9, 10, and 11Z. And this is, this is from the 23Z wrap. So we're looking out about 10 hours here in the future. And what's interesting, I've circled the areas here that would have been favored for sleet. And notice it's only about a two-hour period, one to two-hour period, so 9Z, 10Z. And then notice by 11Z, all this green shows up here, which means the negative energy is not sufficient enough to result in refreeze potential. So it's basically saying at 9 and 10Z here, there would be a potential for sleet in this area. And what was interesting was it kind of nailed the timing almost perfectly. Uh, Rockford here in north central Illinois reported a sleet mixture between 811Z and 931Zulu. And uh, Chicago O'Hare, 845 to 1025 Zulu. After that, it was all freezing rain. So again, mainly a freezing rain event for the area. Uh, just a couple of soundings here also from that wrap for uh, O'Hare at 9 and 12Z. Um, get, look at this sounding here. You can see that initially there was a good amount of dry air in the low levels. So this is another reason where I think uh, using the wet bulb profile uh, for the Burgoyne is certainly going to be better than the actual temperature profile because uh, the wet bulb here certainly picked up on the sleep potential. The max uh, TW aloft here was uh, less than plus one. So initially that would have probably given a little bit more snow for the area. And then if we fast forward here uh, a few hours to 12Z, by this time we've moistened the profile as well as warmed it. We have a uh, max TW off now of 2.2, which is in the magic zone for sleet. But uh, it's a deep layer, and we don't have much refreeze potential in the low levels. You can see it's basically just uh, near the surface that's below freezing now. So by this time, we were just pure freezing rain across the region. And the sleet potential happened about 9 to 10Z. And then uh, just showing uh, some of the weather grids here during this event, uh, we actually didn't have any sleet forecast the, uh, in this particular case. The, the forecaster had manually removed it because it was just a small area for a short period of time, as we saw in those grids. So we focused mainly on the freezing rain aspect of this overall and uh, that seemed to that seemed to work out pretty good for this uh, particular case and uh, here's just a radar uh, image here it starts at about 7z runs through about 9z and basically this was all sleet and freezing rain mixture at this particular time and the energy grids were kind of suggesting that as well as we saw and then by this time, this is looking after 9Z towards the uh, morning there around uh, 12Z. And this wave of precip was all freezing rain at this point. And then eventually as the day went on, we warmed above freezing and then we just had rain. But uh, it's a little bit icy during the morning across the area here with this freezing rain coming across. Uh, this, this same event also affected uh, the Minneapolis area. And they had forwarded us a couple of... Uh, slides uh, showing their uh, perspective on this. And uh, this here is from uh, their sounding, their RAB here from 0Z uh, for the 17th. So it infected them later that day and into the evening. And you can see here their warm nose was at uh, 2.1. So again, kind of that magic zone for the sleep potential in the max TW aloft. Uh, freezing 
or I'm sorry, the uh, melting layer was rather th uh, deep, though, 4,500 feet. Uh, Burgoyne on this would have suggested total melting here. We're just above 20 joules per kilogram and not much refreeze potential near the surface. So the Burgoyne technique would have, uh, would have called this uh, mainly freezing rain in this particular case. Again, the 2.1, kind of that magic zone for sleet. And uh, that's, that's kind of what they said they were getting in their forecast uh, was, was for a, a good sleet event over the area. But uh, at least during the evening time frame, they had mainly freezing rain across the area. As they got some colder air in later, they started to transition over to uh, some snow. All right, so that's, uh, that's the main uh, brunt of this. Again, just two little events here to look at. Um, overall, you know, the melting and freezing energies here, because they represent both the magnitude and depth of the warm and cold layers, this should offer a fully comprehensive precip type forecast. And I like that it takes full advantage of the vertical model resolutions that are available in GFE, which is basically every 25 millibars right now. Um, so we've, we've found that it seems to produce pretty good precip type forecasts, you know, especially for sleet and freezing rain, even in those marginal thermal environments where we get those deep isothermal layers. Uh, and overall, it's you know fairly easy for the forecaster to quickly visualize what precip types may be favored for different areas from the model output. I know personally, I like to overlay my uh, energies, the model energies with say the the wrap energies with the uh, actual radar imagery, and that helps for you know now casts of where snow or s sleep might be occurring. So uh, just some future work, again, uh, possibly whittling this uh, technique down to just two grids to make it a little simpler. We'll have to experiment with that, uh, positive energy toll and just the negative energy. Um, maybe a, a few more refinements to those uh, sleet liquid lines and so forth, and then possibly even uh, publication, hopefully, in the future. So um, that's all I have. Do you have anything to add, Eric? Okay. Okay. I think we can open up to questions then. All right. Excellent, uh, Kevin and uh, Eric. Appreciate that talk. Are there any questions from the field out there? You know, I'll I'll, I'll just throw something out there uh, for the sake of contributing something here to the to the discussion on on the challenges that we all know exist with p-type uh, you know even even for a for a zero to six hour forecast when you feel like you got a pretty good handle on a rel a reasonably good handle on observed uh, thermodynamic characteristics that will support precip type we know that wet bulbing issues and uh, precipitation intensity we see variations in p-type in many situations over that time frame let alone for the six, 12 plus hour forecast challenges and they've got more uncertainties on, on actual model solutions. Uh, and you throw on top of that, applying techniques like this in a super blend, national blend of model environment where you know, you're know you introducing uh, additional uh, degrees of freedom. So I guess what I'm getting at is, uh, I know there's some been talk about that. I see Chuck Greif is on the call and I don't know if he'd be the person to, to maybe address this, but had there been some talk from a from a service delivery standpoint of uh, uh, wintry mix or mixed precip type phraseology in some of our products eventually. Has that been discussed? You talking about having like a winter mix grid? Yeah, it seems like I've heard that here not too, not too long ago from somebody that said that, that was discussed and maybe it fell on deaf ears and it's DOA, but uh, with with pre if we try to be so deterministic on p-type sometime and we see over the course of an hour you can have three different types when things set up properly so I, I sometimes wonder if we're kidding ourselves trying to be too deterministic with some of these approaches and that would address certain situations when we know that variability is going to exist yeah hey, uh, Bruce I, th I think uh, Chuck's a good one to answer that but let me address it in terms of this uh, talk today and one thing that I don't know if it came out or not, but one thing I really like about this technique that Kevin put together is um, you you do first of all it points you toward the most likely precip type that's going to have the highest impact 
And it also includes mention of um, less probable types. So it might say snow likely with a chance of sleet and freezing rain. So there are there are advantages in uh, utilizing this technique for that particular purpose because we know there's been situations where um, it's not necessarily cold enough to snow unless you get a snow squall with very heavy precipitation and then you're wet bulbing. So um, you know the the fact that the technique mentions the most likely precip type as well as the less likely types, I think makes it very valuable, at least in my opinion. Brandon Lockwood gave advice on warning strategies and radar and stuff. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Wow, well, I was here. Oh, well, speaking of that, is there any, uh, no surveying, right? Was it calm? No, sir, a couple storms will follow up on a couple that I think that way. have to put their phone on mute, please. <laughs> there was all kinds of... I was, I was going to say, I've unmuted everyone's phone, so if you're talking, we can hear you. Unless you've muted on your side. Um, After we... Yeah, there Chuck says that. Uh, also, uh, Matt Bunkers has a question, and then Jeff Waltz, director from uh, Eastern Region. Forty-eight knots. Yeah, I don't know if people heard about the uh, the muting issue because we're still hearing a lot of discussion there. One at uh, ten o'clock down there. Let me go back, and I'll just start muting. Yeah, if you get six words one, it tells you that you're. Hey, Jonathan, that sounds like you and Raleigh. I think I got him. <laughs> so can you open that up to uh, to Matt and uh, and uh, yeah. Jeff for uh, for their questions? Sure, go ahead, Matt. You're up. Matt Bunkers, or did you have a you have a question? Okay, um, I must have been still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, sure can. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. So my question was, what was the maximum um, max T aloft that you had, and how did that relate to the uh, the positive energy you had aloft? Uh, some of the uh, some of the events we looked at uh, had uh, positive energies aloft. Uh, let's see here. I thought I had up here. You had a chart earlier, I think, that showed yeah. uh, scatter plot. Yeah, uh, so we were getting some, these were, uh, some of these events I found were down in Oklahoma and so forth where they just had uh, big time warmth aloft. And I believe some of these max T's were, you know, plus 10 or so up there. And you can see they were getting up to, uh, you know, 700 joules per kilogram in this case. But uh, the one thing I noticed is because it was just so, the warm layer was so warm to get this type of negative energies, uh, the, the near surface layer was really, really cold. Have you seen cases where you had uh, a lot of uh, positive energy aloft and, and very limited um, negative area at the surface and that uh, transitioned over to just regular rain quickly or not? Yeah, yeah, most of like uh, down, down in this range um, we were seeing mainly just uh, freezing rain or rain depending on the, uh, so again, the surface temp there. Okay, thanks. So, yep. And uh, Jeff, you had a question? Yeah, um, I mean, this is, uh, this is very interesting. I like this approach. Uh, I was wondering, since there's some quantitative aspects to some of these calculations and, you know, your low-level cold layer is based on 850, what kind of modifications or adaptations would you have to, you know, might need to be done in areas of terrain? You know, and there's kind of the, I'll call the, the, the moderate terrain, like parts, you know, the middle parts of the Appalachians where you're talking about 1,500 to 3,000 feet where 850 is still relevant. And then, and then, of course, you've got the more extreme terrain where 850 is subterranean. Right. Everywhere. Yeah. And so your 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 calculation it, it's going to impact the potential you know the the, the potential um, areas because you can't go all the way down to a thousand millibars. I'll I'll um, I'll address that and then I'll let uh, Kevin add uh, if he has other thoughts. But um, I the Amdar plot that he showed that I wrote code for to uh, decode those Amdar soundings. 
and uh, calculate the energies. I do that for all over the country, and it doesn't, uh, you know, it just starts at the lowest level and goes up. And it, uh, it uses the whole sounding. It doesn't cap it at a certain level. I think just for the development and testing purposes, that's how Kevin wrote his code. But there's nothing that says you couldn't just start at the base of the sounding and uh, calculate your uh, your entire positive and negative energy for the entire sounding, regardless of um, different uh, millibar levels. Yeah, I totally agree. It uh, it is it is certainly uh, applicable. We you just have to change the code a little bit uh, for for the terrain areas. Uh, again, yeah, as as I was testing it initially, we just wrote the code for our area uh, since we don't really have any terrain here, but. But yeah, it could easily be uh, applied to uh, terrain areas as well. So, yeah, so what you're saying, you you would just drop the below 850 constraint Correct. to we, a negative area. Yeah, we just, yeah, yeah. It would impact that more, I think, than it would the positive area of aloft, because there you're just well above the, the terrain in most cases. Yeah. Right, thanks. No problem. Okay, and uh, Dan, uh, you had a question? Hey guys, it's Dan Baumgart. I just had a couple of questions for you. First, uh, when we ran through that verification when we worked together, we saw a tendency to false alarm on, on freezing rain from this technique. And this slide that you have up is a good example that there's a lot of area that's below that, that Burgoyne curve that would give um, a freezing rain. So we adjusted the curve. Um, and I think that's maybe what you were picking up on, um, the, the tendency in some of those cases you showed toward freezing rain. I know the Chicago case had had sleet. Um, the Minneapolis case had freezing rain, and that maybe fits the, the tendency to go toward tr freezing rain in the Burgoyne technique. Do you think that this new curve has improved since last year? The results just um, made of sense. This season versus last, do you think we've reduced the freezing rain tendency in that in that technique? I, I, I think so. Um, unfortunately, you know, most of the cases that we get into up here are kind of down in this range uh, and not so much up in here. Uh, you know, some of these cases that I found that we had the higher positive energy aloft were, you know, down south where you just got those really big warm noses atop the really cold layers. Um, so, you know, I, I think for the most part it has, but again, I think most of our cases have been kind of down in this realm anyway, so I don't know if there would have been a huge difference for those particular events. When we looked at more cases than the ones you applauded here, that that area was a real mess as far as trying to use any kind of a line in there because it was just such a mix-up of different yeah. types. The second question is is more of the practice of, of application and your forecasters and your training in your office. You've been on kind of a, I don't know, is this the third winter, second winter that you've been using this? Can you talk second, a little bit to the yeah, second winter? Yeah, can you talk a little bit to the trajectory of of your forecaster spin up and their comfort zone with this technique and, and how the training and evolution of your forecasters has progressed over the two seasons and how comfortable they are? Yeah, I, I can uh, talk about that a little bit. Um, Kevin has done a lot of one-on-one -on -one training. Uh, we also have another Kevin here, Kevin D'Onofrio, uh, has helped a lot with our GFE programming and he's helped people. Um, I, because we are still not officially uh, a full forecast builder site, um, this hasn't necessarily been a, a mandatory technique for the forecasters and so um, some are just kind of still getting spun up a little bit but um, I think for the most part people have really been able to uh, understand the concepts and um, embrace the idea and I you know I'll speak for myself too because I've helped develop this technique with Kevin but I don't work nearly as many forecast shifts as the rest of the forecast staff but I was on uh, the desk the night that uh, of the Thursday morning sleet event and um, I was the one who had to update the forecast and we also had thunder with that event so 
it was for me basically effortless to um, to do that update using this technique and to account both for the the thunder and the sleet as well as the timing and the location since it was a very brief two or three hour event like Kevin said um, over a relatively small stripe of the metro area um, the, the technique for me uh, was really a lifesaver on that particular event so um, I, I think some forecasters are far more comfortable and confident than others and um, the others are coming along. And, and Dan, I guess yeah, this is the other Kevin here. The uh, I, I think what what Kevin really pointed out is those the the color curve that he's created has really helped us visualize the areas to, to focus in on. And I think those are kind of a thing that's really helped most of the forecast staff to to embrace the, the methodology here as as we've gone forward. And then, but I guess then you know there's. Certainly, there's no you know, like similarly to the top-down methodology. You know, there's certain scenarios where you know you get maybe sleep where you don't want it. You know, and, you know we have there's interpolation that happens between the hourly output from certain models. Um, you know, Kevin's done a great job. Uh, obviously, this doesn't help with the national perspective if you're running this uh, in a more automated method. But you know, it's helped if you know, identify a situation where you don't want certain things. There's very easy ways to manipulate. You know the, the positive energy loft and negative energy low level. Just simply setting them to zero to get to get rid of the things you may not necessarily want in the scenarios. So and I think that's helped for the scenarios, at least initially, where you know maybe it's not getting you exactly what you want. It's been very easy to manipulate those grids in a real, real quick process to to get more of what you would expect conceptually. Yeah, it seems like the color tables are pretty key in, in spinning up the, the staff on how to use these correctly or getting comfortable with the with the joules per kilogram. You know, that's always been one of the things in my mind is how intuitive is it when you're sitting there trying to work through this operationally and do it fast. Obviously, we can train everybody and, and, and they'll come up to speed, but there's just a, a learning curve there. Thanks sure. for your yeah, feedback. Absolutely. Uh, Ed Ray, did you have anything you'd like to say? Yeah, hi John. Um, I was just curious. Hi. This is pretty good stuff, I thought. Uh, how long do you think before we could start integrating some of the techniques they're talking about into the forecast builder? Uh, actually, they're all in there already. You just have to get the grids. If they don't have the grids, you have to put in the GFD. Yeah, Andy. Andy just has been um, real proactive about that. So. Uh, it's all available in there now. You may need to set up uh, your smart nets to actually create the energy grids, but uh, forecast, those exist, and uh, the forecast builder does support the technique, and I think the National Blend also has the, uh, the energy grids that it's producing. Did that help, Ed? Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, any other uh, questions? Uh, Chuck, did you have anything you wanted to add from your perspective? Yeah, uh, John. Yeah, can you hear me, John? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, excellent. I, I didn't know if I got the audio pin screwed up or something. Okay. Um, yeah, this is definitely uh, right in the wheelhouse of what the uh, Forecast Builder Group and the GMAT have been working on. Um, and we're, we're really pleased with what they've uh, done over there in Chicago, test this out for us. I know Andy's been testing it also at a, a cross for, for uh, quite some, a, a good number of these events. And um, what, what I'm seeing here is it really looks like another way to refine where we have some of our biggest hang-ups right now with what we're doing with Forecast Builder. And that's just whether or not it's producing too much sleep. Maybe it doesn't quite get the, the expectation expected uh, freezing rain uh, value correct. If there's another way uh, to maybe check or, or to uh, counterbalance what it's seen by using this technique, and it's a fairly easy way to have this information in all of our, uh, in all of our GFEs um, and be able to calculate that on the fly, 
I, I think there's definitely room for, for using both techniques as, as a check on each other. Um, I would think they both have some strengths and weaknesses, and um, together I, I think we can really hone in on, on what the expected uh, p-type will be. At the same time, I, I, we also are very interested in pushing the mixed p-type as a, a mixed p-type as an option for uh, the weather element. Um, so we're going to be uh, talking about that in our April meeting as well, and and go through whatever steps we need to go through to try to make that a, a, a allowable for the the GFE on a national scale and NDFD. Um, and once that occurs, I, I think you'll see a lot of our uh, a lot of a lot of the trouble that. Is, is still creeping up along these these very uh, um, these if your situations where it's not so clear. I would just uh, I would just kind of build on Chuck's thought there real quick, just to make sure that's clear to everybody. Is uh, we do have a, a grid methodology team uh, get together here at CRH in early April, so all the key players uh, on that team will be uh, will be here discussing. Uh, this issue among many, many others. And as, as, uh, as Chuck just said, I think ultimately we want to find the best solution here that, that is true to the science, but also I think is realistic from a communication standpoint, uh, given, given the uncertainty and the variability that we know exists with, with, with P-type issues. So that balance is going to be what we're going to try to shoot for, uh, whatever that solution may be. And were there any other questions out there? Well, nothing heard. It's been almost an hour, so that's probably a good point to, to, to call it a wrap. Uh, again, I appreciate uh, the hard work of both Kevin and Eric on this and, and sharing this with uh, the folks that were able to participate today. Uh, and with that, unless there's anything real quick from anybody, I think we'll call it, uh, call it good. Thank you, Bruce. We appreciate it. And uh, more importantly, we really appreciate the efforts of the Forecast Builder team in uh, making this possible to uh, interact and collaborate with them. Yeah, excellent. Well, it, it's, uh, it's been, as I'm coming up to speed here on, on all the work you all have been doing on this, it really seems like a, a great uh, example of collaborative work and uh, looking at the same forecast challenge from a couple of different angles and, and that's you know that's of course the scientific process so uh, we want to do what's best ultimately and we'll we'll look at the big picture here and uh, and see what's best down the road oh uh, this is John there was one last uh, question that just came in from Mark McKinley he said could we get the negative and positive energy low level placed on SPC's website <laughs> so something to think about maybe we can ask them about that and Mark you can get in touch with any of us on that too because those those that information I think is available to the National Blend of Models now too right. okay well, excellent. I think we're all set, folks. Uh, I guess it's still before noon uh, for everyone, so we'll say have a good rest of your morning and a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again.